All right, so good morning. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time. These are certainly unusual times we are in. And, and I trust everybody is healthy and, um, and doing the best they can uh, under the circumstances. Uh, I was reminded that a few years ago, a Canadian radio station uh, had a contest that uh, suggested finish the sentence as Canadian as. And the winning entry was as Canadian as possible under the circumstances. So uh, I think I can appreciate where they're coming from with that now because these are circumstances nobody anticipated. So the first thing I, I hope is that everybody is healthy. Um, in the last week or so, I've come to know two people we've lost to COVID. One was a, a colleague who I worked with in the House of Representatives for several years. Um, and then somewhat tangentially, the, the Boyd brothers over in Wilmington, the twins who died, uh, I worked with one of their wives when I worked over at Holton Home. And um, what, a, what a nice family and what a huge loss this is for them. So uh, our thoughts and our prayers really go out to the family. Um, what I can do is report that the stay at home order is, is working. I think it's working the way we wanted it to. It has limited uh, the spread. Uh, our hospitals are not inundated. And I think you can see the difference, what's happening in New York, who waited a bit longer than we did to get going on there. And they're just being devastated. Uh, when you look at what's happened in California, what's looked, happened in New York, you can see how just shutting down a week or so earlier made a huge difference. Um, I can also report that the legislature has been back at work. Um, our focus right now is, is really the health and safety of Vermonters. Um, we, uh, there's nothing more important than the health and safety of our people. And, and that's the first priority. And as we're working on bills, uh, the health and safety of, of Vermonters is, is number one on the list. The second, we're looking at the, the health of our economy. And we're doing what we can to work together with our with our Washington delegation, with the federal, uh, with Congress, to help Vermonters get through this. Um, I work on the House Government Operations Committee, and the primary thing we're working on right now is elections. Uh, we have elections we need to hold as soon as possible because some towns still haven't voted on their school budgets. So we're working on how do we hold an election that holds as paramount the health and safety of voters and the health and safety of the people who are gonna count those votes. So we're, we're looking at the models they've been using for a long time in Oregon, Washington, and some other states, which is primarily voting by mail. Uh, I think by the time we get to the August state primaries and then the, a very important general election in November, uh, we're probably going to have a lot of, or mostly mail-in voting. Uh, there will be some in-person voting. Uh, the challenge we're looking at long-term from what public health officials are is if we open things up too much, we could expect an outbreak soon. And the other thing they're saying is we may be getting an outbreak in the fall anyhow, no matter what, what we do. It's just that the virus is out there, it's circulating, and we don't understand it as well as we could yet. So that's why testing, testing, testing is something we need to get up to speed on. Um, that's about all I'm gonna report now. I'm gonna pass it off to my district mate, Nodder. And uh, before I do, I wanna thank Nodder. Uh, this is Nodder's first term, and he's had quite a ride, but Nodder, Nodder has been a quick learner, he's a hard worker, and he's been a, a great addition to our county delegation and to the House of Representatives. So there you go, Nodder. Thank you, Mike. I, I appreciate it. And, you know, I, you know, mutual admiration here. You know, I, I couldn't have done it without a good mentor, including um, the entire Wyndham delegation. Uh, it's a pretty tight knit team. And, you know, right before the House adjourned, you know, I was talking with another 
um, freshman legislator uh, representative not from Rutland and he was like this is I don't know about you but this is a very bizarre first session that we're having and you know I, I couldn't agree more um, so you know th this w one of the um, big topics that has been coming up which has also been one of the most challenging has been the unemployment insurance and you know that the, the reason that that has been one of the most challenging is because because of the backlog and because of how many people are dealing with the stress and anxiety of not knowing how they're going to pay for their bills and me having to tell folks you just have to keep on trying the number and just keep on calling you know that's people have been have started losing patience with that um, thankfully governor scott has said that the backlog needs to be cleared up by tonight and people who are not cleared by tonight will be receiving a $1,200 check. And he's, we've also um, started the process of implementing about 100 more call center workers, which I think will certainly ease the burden for the Department of Labor. So, you know, I, you know, Mike serves on the Government Operations Committee and I serve on the Judiciary Committee. And one of the things that we've been looking at primarily uh, pertains to constitutional rights um, during a pandemic like this. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that we've been talking about um, has to do with state authority in the midst of a pandemic. And, you know, a, a lot of this stems from a, uh, I, I've, I've gotten a lot of questions about this and I've done a fair amount of research. Um, a lot of what a state can do during a crisis like this stems from a 1905 decision, which is uh, titled Jacobson versus the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And what that implies is that a state can exercise its police power and authority within the discretion of, within the discretion of the state, as long as the U.S. Constitution is not contravened. And so, and, and so that also um, goes parallel to the other issue that we've heard about, um, which is interstate travel, um, which is dictated by part of the U.S. Constitution known as the Commerce Clause, which states that um, individual states cannot affect interstate commerce. And interstate commerce is defined as not just economic, but also social interaction. So we can't create laws that say you know, if you're from Massachusetts, you have to pay extra money to come and, you know, participate in whatever activities you're participating in in Vermont, or, you know, we can't close off borders and so on. Um, that power lies within the federal government. So, you know, we, we've gotten a lot of questions regarding those issues. And um, the other thing I want to touch on, which is in a completely different realm, is you know, people's mental health during all of this. You know, there's, I was reading about this thing called, this concept called anticipatory grief, which is this idea that we, we don't really know what's coming. We don't know when things are going to open up, whether it's going to be in a week or a month or a year. And we don't know what the real toll of all of this is going to be. And that anticipation of, of the incoming grief can cause a lot of anxiety. So, you know, it's, it's normal to feel scared and anxious during all of this. And especially with the fact that we can't socialize except, you know, through zoom conferences. So, you know, it, it's just good to keep tabs on your mental health as well as your neighbor's mental health, whether it's through emails or zoom conferences and, um, and, and also, you know, the, the main purpose of today's, meeting here is mainly to field questions from you folks and to see how Mike and I can help you out. And so with that, I think we can move on to the question and answer phase. How does that sound? Mike, you're muted. What I'm going to do is um, there's also a chat option within Zoom. So if that's one way you want to put a question out there to everybody or to us, uh, but is there anybody that wants to have a question 
answered right now? If you could raise your hand. Uh, I have one. Um, I have a question, Mike. The, uh, the Council of Northeast Governors minus Northern New England seems to have formed a consortium. And I hear it told on anecdotally that New Hampshire is a lot more open than Vermont. And I'm wondering, are we coordinating or are we not? And if we're not, have people uh, considered the, the ramifications of that? No, when you say open, can you define that? I can't. Uh, people I know who, who work on construction and similar things have told me that they can work in Vermont, but not that much. Now, this is prior to the governor's announcement yesterday. Yeah. Um, they could work in Vermont, but not that much, but they like New Hampshire because it's a lot more open, whatever that means. It just yeah. raised a flag for me when I look at the map and I see all of the Koenig states minus Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine participating in a coordinated effort. Yeah. Um, right from the start, I think there has been good cooperation uh, between Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts. Um, right now, I don't think we're part of that bigger piece that includes New York. Um, in regards to being open, yesterday, uh, I think the, the governor did start allowing for some work to happen that wasn't allowed right now. And one of the things he's being very cautious about that I agree with uh, is when, when we start to open things up, we need to go slowly. The challenge for us is that we still don't have the testing capacity that they have in places that, that have gotten ahead of this. And I can share that my roommate up in, in Montpelier has a daughter in Hong Kong and a daughter in Taiwan. Uh, I think Hong Kong is the most congested city in the world. And, and they got ahead of this. Um, in 2003, they had a problem with the SARS, so they learned their lessons and they test, they track, they isolate, and they test again. And they're still doing it, but that's how they got ahead of it. We're not gonna get ahead of it until we get that kind of testing. And the biggest problem right now is at the federal level. We need the president to step up and make sure we get the testing across the United States. And what, what that means is we need the facilities, the supplies to test and the facilities to get the testing done. Um, so right now the governor is cooperating with other states and, uh, but we are, we are on a go slow mode right now. And, um, you know, the, from what I understand, we're all learning about this as we go along. The virus is out there and we still need to be very careful. Um, the expectation is that uh, we may have to shut down again if we open up and that there may be another outbreak in the fall. So uh, in terms of uh, going slow, I'm, uh, I'm in agreement with that. The health and safety of Vermonters is our first concern. So I see there's a question from. Well, just real, uh, real quick, and then I'll shut up because sure. my my concern is not that we should open up. It's that we're not if we're not coordinating along the Connecticut River with New Hampshire, yeah. and New Hampshire is opening up more than we are. We're inviting trouble. The president yeah. has never stepped up, and he's never going to. So it seems to me the two governors need to be formally coordinating, or yeah. else we're risking even more. Well, just just three days ago, the governor did state that he's planning to join a multi-state regional effort to coordinate responses to the coronavirus. Um, and I know that's not the same as the consortium that we're seeing with New York and I believe New Jersey and Connecticut. Um, but I, I don't think that there's a sort of wall that's being created between Scott and Sununu. Um, yeah. So I, I, th there is communication um, going on back and forth. We're actually working we together with the Hampshire supplies. We, we do have a so, few questions in the chat, so I don't know if we want to... Yeah, I saw Michelle's hand um, earlier, so and then we can yeah. do Karen. Um, so Michelle asked, in terms of the $1,200 relief for people who still have not been able to get through the Department of Labor to get unemployment going, how does one apply for that? I have a client who will likely be in this situation. The So I, I don't know precisely how the transactions are happening. I don't believe that it's something you're necessarily applying for. I believe that if you're in the process, um, if you're in the queue, 
and you still haven't gotten through, then similar to the $1,200 from the federal um, government, there will be a sort of direct deposit there. Uh, yeah. I can also do more research on that and get back to you as well. Yeah, my understanding is that we're putting, I think, like 100 extra people on, on the phones and working on uh, applications next week. Um, if by the end of the week, I think what the governor said was, if somebody hasn't been served and their name is in the, the system, that's what they're going to start sending checks out to those people. We're using what's called presumed eligibility. We're presuming people are eligible. We just have to get around to it. So uh, the, the main thing is we want to get money out to people as soon as possible. So Michelle, I think if that person is in the system, they, sh they should, if they can't get through this week, uh, then they, they should be in line for benefit. So when the governor said that the benefits would kick in for people who didn't get through by Saturday, they don't mean today. He means a week from a week from today. Yeah, I think he just. Yeah, I, I don't think there was the expectation was this was going to change overnight. My understanding was next week there's a, a a cadre of extra workers coming on to staff the phones and that we're gonna be looking at this again next week. And if people haven't gotten through or gotten served, then there would be money going out. I don't think it was meant to suggest that overnight this was gonna happen. Okay. So there's a, another question from Karen that was first in the chat a few minutes ago. Uh, she's yep. asking, do we know when the grocery stores will be fully stocked again? I'm disappointed that we have a stay at home order. When we need essentials, we're not able to get them. Wearing a mask now in public is critical. Um, you know, one of the things that I've heard from Commissioner Sherling, the Commissioner of Public Safety, yes. is that, you know, the supply chains are still working and that there is plenty of food in America, but that, you know, the, the, the shoppers are coming in waves and then buying a large amount of things. And then it's causing a sort of back and forth between the supply chain and then restocking the shelves. So, you know, I, I'm not sure when the grocery stores will be fully stocked 100% of the time, you know, it's also, it, I, I, I don't want there to exist a fear that there's going to be a lack of food or supplies in the country. A lot of it has to do with the logistics of the actual truckers and trains transporting these supplies to the stores. So, but the commissioner did state that the supply chains, although they're being worked to the max, they're still working and items are being delivered to stores. I don't know if that helps answer your question. Another consideration is that uh, within a month or two, we're hoping to start seeing some Vermont produce, uh, leafy greens uh, and things like that to help supplement what we've been importing from other states. So Karen, is there a specific item your concern or items now michael what i'm concerned about when i go into the stores it seems to be the big distributors you know the brand name items mm -hmm. you know i'm amazed that like pasta is still you know you have empty shelves yeah you know, and we know about the paper products i get that but yeah it i relied on going online you know and trying to yeah. order products but I, I was in Hannaford's yesterday and this was early in the morning they were pretty well stocked but the pasta the flour the cake mix that was right. kind of kind of light um, I noticed the same I was there yesterday too I yeah. noticed the same thing yeah and it's been like this since the virus has started so yeah. the the grocers association tells us the food's forthcoming but I have a feeling we're down on the, the, the chain uh, when it comes to, from the national sources. So, And I'm um, feeling that too. Yeah. And seeing it. Yeah. I mean, all right, we'll have to see, see what happens. We'll have to wait. But you're right about the local resources, though. I think there's a lot of lists out there that people can go to, and we have to support mm -hmm. local farmers right now yeah i agree so we have um tony elliott has a 
let's see if he's the next in line. No, let me see. <laughs> so we, we got to Karen, we got to Michelle, uh, Claire and Jack um, have a question about testing. And Claire says, Jack got tested in Putney. Um, we're, we've increased the testing sites. The, the pop-up site in Putney was just meant to be there a few weeks. It's traveling around the state now. If need be, it can come back. But um, if you need to get tested now, you just call your primary care, um, <clears throat> primary care provider, and they will connect you with a, where, where you can get tested. If you don't have a primary care provider, dial 211 and they will refer you to a, to a place you can get tested. And Gary has, um, I think it's the next question from that where Gary asks, can we anticipate that the stay at home order will be extended beyond May 15th? And I think a lot of that depends on how Vermonters handle the next um, three or four weeks really because you know, we, as a state and the people in this state, we were, in my opinion, quick to act on the governor's guidance to engage in social distancing. But one of our concerns is seeing a second spike that would come and potentially reinfection. Um, so it, it really depends on how well people participate in social distancing over the next couple of weeks. Um, but it's... Yeah. With, with the way the disease works, it's hard to anticipate precisely where we'll be a month from now. The, the Vermont Department of Health um, anticipated that the last two weeks of February and the first week of May uh, would be critical times for us. Uh, the hope was that we could level the spread uh, and not inundate our hospitals. So far, we've done that, but these next three weeks are gonna be critical and, and at that point, hopefully, uh, we can continue to flatten the curve. And what they're looking for are, are two weeks in a row of diminishing numbers before they really start to look at, at opening things up more. So uh, I have a lot of faith in what the Vermont Department of Health is doing and the infectious disease uh, experts that they have in there. Uh, I think they've given us some good advice and, and I'm ready to keep following that. So we'll, we'll know more in the, in the next two to three weeks. So, and I believe the next question is from Joyce, which is yesterday, the governor said that he was anticipating a conference call today about a New England consortium. What action does the state anticipate when Trump tweets, liberate Vermont? Uh, I, I, I never even really know how to react when I see the majority of the tweets myself. So. I'm, I think I'm not, were he I'm to do saying. that, uh, he's not very popular in Vermont, if you haven't noticed. The last election, he only got 30% of the vote. I don't see him getting that this time. I think Vermont's response would be to thumb their nose at something like that. Uh, he's, it's been a complete failure of leadership at the top right now. He's flailing around, and I don't think people, I don't think many people are paying much attention to him, especially in Vermont. It's, it's also been focused, these tweets about liberating states has, have been focused on states with Democratic governors as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how Scott would, Governor Scott would respond to something like that either. <clears throat> So uh, Liz, Liz had a question about education funding and a balanced budget. Uh, Vermont does not require a balanced budget. Um, and one of the reasons, though we're going to stay in session, uh, probably into September, is that we're waiting to see what the, the revenue numbers are going to be. Uh, right now, the indications are there's going to be uh, all of our uh, main funds are going to be short. And um, what we're going to do is continue working online probably through June, July, and then take another recess and come back in September to finalize the budget for next year. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the all of the funds 
the general fund, transportation fund, education fund uh, have the resources they need to move forward. And the other piece is our hope is that our federal delegation will continue to do really well by Vermont. Our hats off to Senator Leahy. He has been in the room during these negotiations as he's the, the ranking Democratic member on the Appropriations Committee. Vermont just got a huge percentage, much bigger than our population suggests because of having S Senator Leahy in the room in, in this recovery uh, resources. So we're gonna take our time, wait till we see the numbers come in and then, and then make sure all the funds, including the education fund, have what they need to move forward into the next year. Mike, can you hear me? We can. Yep. Um, so we were one of the districts. Yeah, we were one of the districts, as you know, that couldn't vote on a school budget. That's right. And from, from what we've heard, um, our budget was set to go up 5%. And from what we've heard, there's stuff in the House. One is to do a 4% for people who didn't pass a budget. But my biggest concern is the stress on families and um, more and more kids are going to have a lot of ACEs after all of this because we have so many families that were just, you know, they weren't quite falling that way, but they are now. And if we're left without any idea of a budget, how do we proceed? So what we're gonna do is we're working on a way to, so people can vote on the budget that you passed. Uh, hopefully we can do that, in, and I think we will before the July 1st deadline. So you'll have a budget. Uh, a contingency will be that you'll use last year's budget, but I don't think we'll have to go in that direction because uh, we're gonna be setting up the the idea that we can vote by mail on this budget. There, there's a number of districts out there that haven't voted on their school budget yet. So we're going yeah. to continue to be able to work on that. And I hope, you know, early May we'll have a situation where we'll be able to get those budgets voted on. Well, the, uh, if, if we can move on the, is that, can we move on from that? Yep. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Cindy Fine. Uh, speaking of grocery shopping, can there be a mandatory wearing of masks and gloves for cashiers, stockers, et cetera? These are the only places we can go. We need to be as safe as possible. Um, I agree with you that we definitely need to be as safe as possible. The, uh, we, we can mandate that, but that would be something that comes from the governor in an executive order at the moment. So that would require writing to the governor's office. Um, uh, when, when I went to Hannaford's, I'm seeing some, some employees, some are wearing masks, others are not. Some are abiding by the six feet rule and others are not. I mean, ironically, I was, there, there was an employee who was walking beside me within two feet for an entire aisle. And he had on this vest that said, please stay six feet back. And I, I was like, well, we all have to participate in that, don't we? Yeah. But I digress. Um, the the Hannaford's itself in Brattleboro also is not currently mandating their employees to wear these items, um, the PPE, and you know that can be influenced by talking to the managers and reaching out to them and asking them why this yeah. hasn't been done. But there's also the part that PPE is in short supply, according to them, from what we've heard. Yesterday, I was there and spoke to that issue as well. What I was told is they have protective equipment for the staff, but it's not mandatory. It's up to the staff whether they want to use it. So what we're doing, and we suggest you do the same thing, and contact the governor's office. And if he puts this into an order, then they're going to have to do it. So the more people he hears yeah. from, the, the better it is that something like that will happen. So our next question, let's see, where are we at now? So I, I think the next one is from Karen. Uh, did I hear independent contractors and or sole proprietors can claim 
unemployment and is it set up online? Um, One second. Yeah. My understanding is this week, uh, they're gonna be hopefully setting that up so that independent contractors and self-employed um, can start to apply. Um, that's federal money that's come in and the feds are expecting us to set up a separate bookkeeping uh, system and record keeping for that. Uh, the hope is it'll be online this week. Tony, let's get you unmuted. Hi. Um, I just want to reiterate my comment about using online resources. The state is a little behind in that regard. I had an employer, another employer call me and said, do you have a fax machine? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, the only way I'm allowed to send this information that has been requested by the state is uh, by fax or by mail. And, and I'd like to see some resources going to this area uh, instead of so many telephone uh, attendants because the telephone business is a synchronous thing. You've got to connect with a person. The uh, internet use, you can do asynchronously and uh, you know, don't have to actually connect with a person. And uh, New Hampshire is doing it very well. And we might want to look at some of their resources. It's not perfect over there, but uh, yeah. I have em employees in both states. And, and so that was a, an issue. Yeah. Uh, that that's a good point, Tony. Uh, part of our problem is the Department of Labor's computer system is 30 years old. The Agency of Human Services system is 40 years old. And whenever we keep asking to make these upgrades, uh, we get told there isn't the money for it. Uh, our hope is that now they're going to realize uh, we can't keep selling ourselves short in this area. So the, the idea of the, of the new, the extra phone people is so we can free the Department of Labor staff to, to work online and work on the actual applications and let the other people help get the backlog of phone calls down. I'll, I'll just comment, New Hampshire has outsourced a good deal of that. Uh, Vermont started to do outsourcing to the same organization and yeah. I contacted them to sign up. Uh, they responded and said, we've been told to tell you to call this number in Vermont. And that's, that's uh, just not moving forward. Uh, and yeah, it's well, my understanding is that firm is going to start this week. <clears throat> that's a good sign. Thank yeah, you. We have, we have <laughs> signed give them the money off. they need because I, that'll really pay off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wanted Thanks. to throw out, oh, sorry. I wanted to throw out two different points real quick um, in regards to Karen's question that was posted earlier for self-employed folks. I just posted a link in the chat um, for the department of labor and um, self-employed individuals who are looking for information. So if you follow that link, it should lead you to an FAQ that should be able to help you out. I know a lot of, I know there are a lot of self-employed folks in our district, and I don't want to put Laura Chapman on the spot, but I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, Laura, we were talking about just getting a quick update from the town's perspective in Putney, and we're wondering if you could just spare a minute or two just to give us some information about what the town is up to and you know, anything that might be able to help out. Can you give me just a minute? You caught me at kind of a bad moment. In like no five worries. minutes, I'll be All right, able sure. to. We'll, we'll, take, okay. we'll take a few more questions and then, uh, okay, awesome. Sounds okay, good. Okay, so, thank you so much. Yeah, so, thank you. Ruby, Sorry to Ruby put you had a question about the budget. Um, so the, there's two budgets we're talking about, Ruby. The, the state budget we're talking about is for the next fiscal year. The votes that we want to get going are for the school budgets that start July 1st. So. Two, two different things there. Can I, can I just, uh, can you just clarify for me just one second there? So we, the budget that the school has delayed, the vote that we're gonna be having at some point in the near future is related right. to the next school year. Is that not in the next fiscal cycle? 
Am I wrong about that? Um, education funding and, and the, the, the big budget actually are not in, in sync. And it's one of the challenges we, we keep running up against. Usually by the town, town meeting comes around and we want to vote on budgets or the way we used to, uh, the state didn't have the, the numbers ready. So it, it's kind of a, a delayed financial piece there. So um, what we're going to be voting on for the, 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 this district, it's not the town anymore, and I still haven't wrapped my head around that. Um, and we hope to get that vote out before the July 1st implementation of it. Um, there, there's money in this general fund budget that will be able to cover the expenses there. And when I'm talking about voting for a big budget, the state budget in, in September, uh, approximately, we're not quite sure of that yet. That's for the, the next fiscal year. I hope that makes sense. But they're, they're not in sync the way we would hope they are. Right. It does make sense. I just, um, I'm, I feel like there's, a, a, as a, someone in the school district who follows the budgeting process, I do feel like we're, we're gonna approve it and then there's information that has to come from the state. And I, I feel a little bit, I understand that that might just be, there might be a delay always, but this um, delay of the states looking at a budget, I just i am wondering how that's gonna affect the schools. Yeah. But I do think that you answered, I think Liz had a question, a similar question, you answered it. I don't, I don't think that I need a definitive rollout of an answer, but um, sure. just a concern. We're, we're going to make sure that the resources are there. We anticipate with all the funds that there's going to be shortfalls. So what we want to do is, is look and see what we get from the federal government that we can use in those budgets and how we can. The, one of the challenges right now is a lot of the federal money has a lot of strings attached to it. So uh, we can't just roll it over into the state budget and then we'll see what we need to uh, to make those other funds whole. Right. Education fund, transportation, general fund. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Mike. Laura, how Laura? are you? Hi, sorry about that. Um, it's unfortunately, sometimes when I'm on these Zoom meetings, I'm multitasking and you caught me in a moment when I was multitasking. Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, so on a town level, um, well, the school budget's a little concerning. Um, that could push back our budget, which um, be, might become an issue with taxes. And um, you know, we're not, uh, it's obviously far more well versed on this than I am, but I understand that that could become a concern for us and we might have to get creative. Um, and so we're hoping that the state will have some guidance as to how we're going to go forward with that. Um, we, uh, the fire department and the emergency management department have done an excellent job. They are very well prepared for worst case scenario at this point. Um, they feel like they're going, from my understanding, from what was expressed to me in our last meeting, they feel like they're going more from um, the reactive to and getting more into um, the, the further end of response mode. So um, that's, that's a really good sign for us. And it's, it's exciting to see that we um, seemingly have plateaued. Um, that's really good news. Uh, what else? Everything is shut down, as folks know. If you need anything, Karen is in town hall two days a week. Jonathan's in town hall two days a week. I believe it's Mondays and Wednesdays for Karen and Tuesdays and Thursdays for Jonathan. Um, Jonathan's our town clerk, if folks don't know that. And um, they're accessible every day of the week, Monday through Friday, through, the, through email. Um, and you can call and leave a message anytime. They're super responsive. Um, are there any questions on a town level? We did just find out that our road crew had more restrictions than we had initially thought. And I'm curious how that's gonna shake out with the new 
um, amended order. So. Yeah, I think they're going to be able to do more now, even though yeah. I, I know they've been working hard as it is. And, and I hope they don't have to get out in the snow today. Me too. It's, it's not that bad here, though, so far. So, um, uh, you know, we've been working with Putney Mutual Aid, which is very exciting. Kudos to Ruby, who's on this call. She's done a tremendous amount of work with that. Um, yeah, that's all I've got. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, Thank one other you, thing. I just one other thing. We are encouraging people to um, go and check the portal on the on the um, voting website. Make sure that your voting information is correct, and sign up to vote via mail. Um, this will reduce. Essentially, we're very hopeful that this will reduce the need to have um, any kind of live voting. Yeah, thank you. Can we sign up for by mail voting now? I mean, is yes. That... Okay, good. So we yeah. have about I... fifth, go ahead. No, go ahead, I was so, gonna do a time right. check now too. Yeah, yeah, so uh, we have about 15 minutes left and I was wondering if we have any other questions that we either missed or any topics we haven't touched on yet that you folks wanted to hear, or if there's anything that you want us to do some more research on and then we can get back to you. Um, anyone have anything? So we do need Matt. So I got one question that is we do need masks that work better for people with glasses. And as someone with glasses, I can, I, I do agree with that. Um, and another one, can we continue these chats in the near future? I, I would say so, yes, that would be, that would be good. Um, I think maybe, I'm not sure what the, I mean, we're, we're using a platform right now that's um, being run by Spencer for, with the Vermont Democratic Party. And I think that we could schedule other times maybe in the future um, and then yep. maybe we can put together something a bit more regular. Yep, there's another platform too that I'm looking into um, that Google has, that uh, Google Meet, which uh, I think if I get an account with that, I can hold meetings with up to 50 people. So um, Zoom is great. We've been using Zoom for our legislative committees. Uh, we're gonna use it, I think, for the, the whole house when we start meeting as a group. Um, but it is expensive. Uh, the Google piece, I don't think, is quite expensive. But I'd like to continue to do these. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is we had a briefing yesterday from Chris Dahlia, who heads up the Vermont Bankers Association, and, and it's about the stimulus checks and the, the payroll protection plan. Um, the stimulus checks uh, started going out, but it's going to be a slow rollout. I think one of the things he said is if you're not already in the system because you received a rebate in the past um, or if you went through uh, certain online systems it may be they don't have the information you can check on the IRS website um, but the other piece is uh, the printing of the checks apparently their capacity is to do five million a week and um, that's going to take us out 10 12 weeks to get checks to all the people uh, who aren't going to get them direct deposited. There is a website. You can look at the IRS website to, to find that information. And as far as the planned, the, the payroll protection plan, um, it worked really well here in Vermont and across the country, and it worked so well, the fund is out of money now. So the hope is that next week, Congress can appropriate more money. And the basic idea is that you get a loan if you use the loan to keep your staff uh, going, at, at the end of this period, the loan will be forgiven, it will turn into a grant. And it, it, the idea is to keep people out of the unemployment system. Uh, that the next step though is if, if that's not an option, if you're, if you're a worker, then to, to look for unemployment benefits. Now, was there another question that came up? 
or several. Cindy, was that a hand? Question, I just wanted to thank you. Oop, am I still muted? Oh, oh, you're, I'm you're good. Okay. Um, I just wanted to thank you both so much for everything that you're doing. And um, I've been in conversation with Mike over the last two weeks, just trying to figure out if my business can start up again. And um, you've just been wonderful. And all the way up to the governor, I feel so um, grateful that we have a capable person in charge, lots of capable people, um, cautious people, and um, empathetic people. So, well, well thank you. Sure. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you're going to be able to get started and that Michael's going to be able to open the cafe in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Looking forward to getting some food there. Okay. And just to get a plug, you know, that's Cafe Loco up at Carlos. <laughs> Michael's woohoo we in wanna, the background. Hey, we, we want to support all the local people. Putney Diner, the general store, the, the 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 gleanery. These are all people that are struggling to keep their businesses. So if you they can, are doing curbside some, pickup, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We're not letting yep. you anywhere near <laughs> near the, near the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, also all the other businesses like the general store, the gleanery and the oh. uh, diner are also, you know, just so folks know, they're also doing a uh, curbside as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we want to do more of these and, and I hope you reach out to people. You know, one of the reasons the Putney Mutual Aid got started and in, in, in all, all towns around here is so we can reach out to each other. Um, we, we need this contact. We, if anything, we're reminded what social beings we are and we need contact like this. So if you know somebody who, who doesn't have these options, hopefully you can give them a call or, or get them. Like my wife got uh, taught her mother, who's 80, just turned 89, uh, how to do FaceTime now. So she can, she can break down some of her isolation and, and talk with people regularly. So it's, it's important that we, we reach out to people and, and, and take care of us both inside and outside. Any more questions? What? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Mike. Where there's a, it's Laura. From Gary, I... there's a question. Where do we sign up for voting for mail? Karen? I just put a link. It's Laura. I just put a link above where okay. Gary asked in the chat. All right. Excellent. What a team, huh? <laughs> and, Laura, I want to thank you as chair of our select board for all that you've been doing, uh, along with working your regular job and your family and your kids. Um, it's been amazing to see all that you've taken on and, and, and to know that um, help is on the way when you're around. And thank, thank you, you all. For, oh, and thank you all for coming to participate in this. You know, I bef before coronavirus, I thought I was a introverted person, but now I'm just like starved for human interaction. So this is, this is great. Um, and, you know, if, if this time on Saturdays generally works well, I mean, you know, we have 22 participants, that's um, pretty good. You know, normally we have between five to 10 people. When we used to meet in person, we'd have between five to 10 people, but, you know, we have around 20 now. So, you know, if we want to do Saturdays, um, you know, we can try to figure out how we can set up a regular thing because there's a lot of information that's constantly changing and being updated. Um, it's a very fluid situation. So, you know, we can probably provide more updates in this manner as well. Yeah. So Randy Solon, how are you doing? Did, do you have any specific questions? I see you sitting there. Um, I wanted to make one quick comment, I guess, about yesterday I went to Walmart, which I never ever do, and it was so frightening. Like, I literally had an anxiety attack, which I don't normally have either. But they are not following any, any of the procedures that we are in Vermont. To Jim's point, it seems pointless if we're just a couple miles away. <clears throat> And there's no follow through between the state borders. Yeah. They, they weren't wearing masks. People were not keeping any distancing. 
no gloves. Not, there was absolutely no protection. And yep. any, any way, I would not go back there again. No, uh, thanks for that, yeah. for, that, for that update for everybody. And I would say shop local anyhow, but. Yeah, I needed one of those CO2 tanks, so. Yeah, yeah. But I do have one question regarding the idle program. I haven't heard, I was on a BDCC call yesterday. Yeah. And nobody in Wyndham County has heard or received anything. I just wanted to see if that's true with this group. <laughs> yeah, what was that, the uh, program? Idle or E I D L E I D L. It's it's one of the business uh, the options for businesses to get help. Um, yeah, it's not something I'm. I, we can get some more information. I okay. There was something yeah. said about that in our briefing yesterday, but. Uh, it didn't sink in, so I can I can get that information to you. Okay. Did Did you sign up for for any of that? I did. I did. Yeah. For the gallery and for Soul and Glass. Yeah, I know that um, um, Sojourns got a. Uh, uh, I'm on the board over at Sojourns in Westminster, and they did get a um, one of the SBA loans, but I guess you had to get in early. And, and hopefully we can, like I said, Congress can, can put more money into that so the money can keep flowing out. So Joyce, Joyce and Brian. Okay, can you unmute yourself, Joyce? There we go. Okay, so this little conversation about masks, um, not much we can probably do about Walmart, uh, but except not go there. Um, but uh, this Thursday, I was in Walpole at Shaw's and at Job Lots, and, and people were wearing masks and gloves, except one woman said she couldn't breathe through them. Another woman said, and this came up again, fogs her glasses, she can't work with it. And yet we have a, over 50 people making masks with all kinds of different materials and addressing different problems. Um, I think if we do some kind of coordination to help those who would like to wear a mask but can't, there are yeah. different, you know, some fabrics are more breathable. They may not protect quite as much, but they do protect. 50% is better than nothing. Um, and yeah. there are ways of keeping the mask, you know, the breathing through the mask from fogging up your glasses. Uh, not easy, can guarantee it, but <laughs> can be done. Um, I don't know how we could go about that, but there is um, a spreadsheet put out by Jen Batty and her crew who are organizing all of this that possibly we could address that issue to through that and then get yeah. something to those folks who really can't use a standard surgical mask. That's, that's a good point and I think Distributing more of the masks or maybe having a supply as you walk into a store might be another option. So let, we'll look into what's happening. My guess is it's not a it's not an isolated problem. So maybe we can find out what other places are doing. Mike, could I speak to that for one second? This is Ruby with uh, Putty sure. Made. I just wanted to reply, Joyce, that the um, the work that Jen Batty's doing, they're very clear that they're focused on vectors of something like basically organizational need that will help impact and slow the spread and i think so i think at this time keeping abreast of what they're doing is important but at this time the need you're talking about which is individuals who have are are at high risk or just individuals who want to go out and want to follow the orders and have problems with the the no so bandana that's something that's come up quite a bit. And I, I do think Putney Mutual Aid has been, has had this on our minds. I, I think that um, the Food Shelf and the Meals on Wheels, which are both organizations on that spreadsheet, are trying to um, get enough masks to put into the packets that go out, at least initially, so that everybody gets one. Um, so that's an organizational thing, but, but I, I hear you and that this has been on my mind of how do we 
how, how do we help individuals who have those needs and and can't can't handle a bandana so um so i would suggest if you live in putney be in touch with putney mutual aid uh, if you have ideas i know next stage was interested in trying to coordinate this so it may be that an effort could happen but i don't think we should rely on jen's um spreadsheet for that particular um need not for that spreadsheet um because yeah. we could do a, a different one but maybe not through jen because she has her hands full but ruby let's be in touch because okay. i have some thoughts great can i jump in real quick too i know that the putney food shelf is getting a rather large donation of masks and we'll be distributing them. Additionally, as someone that wears glasses normally and wears the mask quite a large portion of the day, um, it's really important that you have a tight fit around your nose. Mm -hmm. So if you have a mask that doesn't have a tight fit around your nose, to even hot glue a, um, a paper clip into it so that you can fit it um, is, is one method or any, or any other kind of piece of wire that can make it tight fitting. Um, and then for people that have difficulty breathing through them, t-shirt masks, although not as effective at um, reducing particles are uh, still somewhat effective and um, easier to breathe through. Yeah, they're about 50% effective. Is yeah. Well, we're gonna have to wrap up here. But I want to thank everybody. Um, look, look for more information. We definitely want to do this again. And please feel free to get in touch with us anytime if you have a question or you need help with something. Thank you all. It was good seeing everybody.